Like I'm sorry. What was that? Right. 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 Uh, you know, I don't know. There's a, there's a partnership that owns most of that property, if not all. Now, I think Target owns their own parcel. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to, I think that the rest of those parcels, maybe one or two outstanding, are all owned by the real estate partnership. So, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie's a major player in that. Yeah. Actually, originally the Bush family owned all that property. <laughs> so I don't know what I, I know I know the target purchased that parcel from the Bush family or the, the real estate trust or whatever was set up to, to handle that. Um, but I don't know about Cracker Barrel or that small subset of strip stores just to the, to the west of Cracker Barrel. I don't know about the rest of the I'm sure they do. He's trying to get Yeah. I'd say probably enjoy San Diego a little bit more, but the weather and not in this building is so it's fifty cents on it's, it's fifty cents on a thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> we don't have to go that far, probably twenty five cents. And and I the, yeah I go back to my original point was yeah. the October seventh budget meeting it was down well, to zero tax right. increase mm -hmm. so yeah. I go back to my original statement if you had done your if if, if the homework oh, had been done appropriately okay. that all those numbers should have been in line by October seventh yeah. so that. Discussion should have been final, and and, and if there was any outstanding questions, it should have been stated in that meeting to say, okay, on October the twenty-first or whatever that second meeting was, then we will finalize. But when John left that meeting, he was under the sincere impression that everything was done. I did the same in part. So what happened? Henry Allen, five yards. They didn't pass the budget the other night. Aaron Jones, 20 yards receiving. Oh, and they said they were right. They told the budget. Oh, yeah. Apparently, they used the budget meeting. They can't vote on the budget meeting. That's an informational meeting. That's got to be done in public. Not unless they tell us to. I don't know. I'll go back and look. Yeah, I mean, just some kind of stuff that's going on. If you sit Good morning. Can you say yes or no? And that's it. Yes, who do we have? Oh, this is Randy. Hi, Randy. Who else do we have? Good morning, Counselor. Morning, Commissioner. Morning, Jason. Morning. Morning. We're going to ask you to please rise for the opening prayer and place of allegiance. And before we have our opening prayer, I'd like to express our condolences um, to 
the family of Mike Balton. Mike Balton was our geo uh, program director on the other side of those walls over there for many years since geo reentry had started. Um, Mike tragically lost his battle with cancer on Tuesday. He was only 46 years old. He was a, a mentor to our community, um, was a football coach, outstanding individual, uh, survived by six children, and uh, he'll be sorely missed by our community. So I ask you for a moment of silence for Mike, and then we'll go into the, uh, our prayer. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we celebrate this day of life in a beautiful area that we call home. We thank you that you are perfectly faithful. You stand on your promises and never fail us. You instruct us to bring everything to you in prayer. So many times our prayers are filled with what we want instead of being thankful for what we have. The word silent can also be spelled with the same letters to the word listen. We should be silent and listen to your answers to our, in our prayers. In this Thanksgiving season, when so many are suffering across the world, let us be eternally grateful for the blessings you have bestowed upon us. Let us follow your example of love and compassion by reaching out in the ways we can check on the elderly and the families that are suffering hardships. During this Thanksgiving season, let us take time to give thanks to you, Lord. This morning, Father, we pray for the 25 Sheriff Cadets that were struck by a vehicle yesterday in California. The vehicle was going in the wrong direction when it struck these cadets that were training. Many were seriously hurt, and we pray you'll be with them and their families at this time. We pray for all law enforcement that you'll keep them safe and out of harm's way. Father, you instruct us in your word not to be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, for to present our request to you. May we in this Thanksgiving season, and each day throughout the year, remember and follow these words. Now, Lord of peace and understanding, may you pour your grace, love, and healing upon our valley. These things we humbly pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> At this time, we'll convene the commissioner's public meeting. Commissioners, um, I have two changes that are not on the published agenda. Uh, <clears throat> first, I'd like to um, add 3.2, which is ratification for the payment that was due on uh, 9 November, which was paid on 10 November for $1 million to step. So you're going to be ratifying the check runs for that. And then <clears throat> when we get to action items, I'd like to move to 9.12. Talk to Mr. Chairman, I'll move to add the item described as 3.2 ratification for payment. And the I don't think we have to vote to move something out of order, but I'll add that also. Okay. All favor, say aye. 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 So carried. Aye. Okay, so that's good. As for uh, approve of, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Do we have any public comment on agenda items only at this time? And online? Okay. Your proclamation. We're joined today by the coroner, and we have a proclamation, Infant Safe Sleep Month, November 2022. Whereas the safety of children in Lycoming County is of the utmost importance, and whereas thousands of infants in the United States die each year due to an empty crib while lying on their backs with a tightly fitted sheet, 
I apologize. Whereas thousands of infants in the United States die each year due to placement in an unsafe sleeping environment, infant fatalities caused by unsafe sleeping environments are entirely preventable. And whereas the safest sleeping environment for infants is alone in an empty crib while lying on their backs with a tightly fitted sheet, as well as warm, comfortable sleepwear, and whereas the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development provides family members and child care providers with access to resources about creating safe sleeping environments for infants on their website. Now, therefore, we, the commissioners of Lycoming County, hereby proclaim the month of November 2022 as Infant Safe Sleep Month and encourage the community to spread awareness of how to create a safe sleeping environment for all infants and young children throughout the county. In witness whereof, we've set our hand and seal on this 17th day of November 2022. Signed by Cumming County Commissioners Scott L. Metzger, Chairman, Tony R. Messier, Vice Chairman, and Richard Marabito, Secretary. And I know we have the coroner here and uh, one of his staff, and I hope that they can correct any uh, confusion I've created about the safe sleeping. And I apologize for that. Chuck and Kate. I'm going to defer Kate because she's kind of the the expert in the office um, is kind of taking on this very important um, program as managing the uh, Cribs for Kids program. We started this, it's hard to believe it's been 14 years since we started this in the office and we've put hundreds of cribs and pack and plays and full size cribs out there to needy parents and uh, we work closely with the uh, social service folks at the hospital, the labor and delivery people in uh, UPC um, and other you know, uh, facilities that Kate will be able to talk to more about. But it uh, truly did save lives. We've gone three years um, without a, an unsafe <coughs> sleep death of an infant. Um, unfortunately, we broke that. I wish we could just do that forever. But um, unfortunately, there's just some child, infants that will um, die in unsafe sleep environments. So we're going to continue to do this as long as I'm um, in this position and hopefully it will carry on. So I'll let kind of Kate fill in and Representative Joe Hamm also has uh, his proclamation as well. So. Oh, great. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Um, and thank you for bringing us together again to share in the mission of preventing um, infant deaths due to unsafe sleep. I would like to say that this problem is getting better, but as Chuck has stated, unfortunately, we have had seven babies die in Lycoming County since 2019, um, specifically in unsafe sleep environments. Um, and although we sometimes disagree on other things, I think we can all agree that even one of these deaths is too many. Um, the ABC safe sleep message continues, babies should be alone on their back in a safety approved crib with nothing but a fitted sheet. Um, <clears throat> but I would be doing a disservice to our community and our babies lost if I didn't provide some additional Safe Sleep updates. On November 12th of this year, the Safe Sleep for Babies Act went into effect. This act prohibits the manufacturing and selling of padded crimp crib bumpers and incline infant sleep products. So that's something that's been years coming and legislation finally pushed that. Um, so what does this mean for parents and caregivers of infants? If you're using an incline sleep product or crib bumpers, yes, even the mesh ones, um, you should stop using them immediately. There have been multiple deaths linked to these items, which is what motivated the passage of this specific law. Just because, because the items are manufactured does not mean they're always safe for sleep. After all, cancer is still linked with tobacco products, but they are still manufactured all the time. Um, baby products are no different. We know better now, so we have the responsibility to do better. Um, this year, I was able to connect with a very special woman. Her name is Stacy Bogle. Um, Stacy and I connected through social media as she's the founder of the Infant Safe Sleep Foundation in Kansas. Um, the foundation is in honor of her son, Jaleel K. Sean Kitchings, who was born on May 18th, 2006, and received his angel wings on June 13th, 2006, due to an unfortunate um, co-sleeping incident. If you listen to Backyard Broadcasting at all through Safe Kids, we do two public service announcements a month on Backyard Broadcasting. Um, you can listen to her story on there about how this was her third child and she thought it was okay to co-sleep and unfortunately he did not survive that. Um, <clears throat> Stacy is a hero in that she recognizes her son's death as being preventable and is willing to risk judgment of others in sharing her story to prevent the deaths of countless other infants. As a Safe Sleep Ambassador, for Lycoming County Cribs for Kids, 
I continue to do my part by providing pack and plays and cribs to families in need several times a month, all which has been done in the coroner's office through grant funding and donations since 2009. As with all other safety for our children, it does take a village. If you're not a part of that village, I welcome you to become a part of it as we are all responsible for the children in this community. Some of our Child Safety Village members are in the room today and some are listening in online, such as staff from UPMC, Nurse Family Partnership, Allie's here today, um, Geisinger, Department of Health, STEP, WIC, ELECT, Expectations, the Lycoming County Health Improvement Coalition, and many others I'm certain I'm forgetting. Um, these partners continue to provi provide the best prevention they can by educating our local parents and caregivers about infant safe sleep. Um, I also cannot forget our government partners, the commissioners, and Representative Joe Hamm and Eric Hauser is here today um, from Joe Hamm's office um, to bring light to safe sleep every November. Other members of our community can continue to support this mission by making a donation to the Lycoming County Health Improvement Coalition, which is the fiscal sponsor for our local Cribs for Kids program. Um, that helps us continue to provide safe sleep products such as pack and please and full size cribs to all low income families in need in our community. That's all I have. Okay. We're honored to have uh, Representative Joe Ham here today. Joe, would you like to do your proclamation? Thank you for being yeah. with us. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, my pleasure to be here today to honor uh, or, or in honor of Infant Safe Sleep Month in this Commonwealth. And uh, look, if, if by making this um, proclamation every November of every year, if we save one life, um, it's worth every second we put into it. Uh, we know life is precious, and um, you know, bringing uh, these types of things to the forefront so that uh, young mothers, uh, maybe mothers who've had their third child, uh, know about safe uh, sleep practices uh, for their infants uh, again, we'll continue to do it. So it's my great honor to carry on the tradition that uh, Representative Garth Everett started many years ago, uh, providing this uh, proclamation. And uh, today I'll just read to you uh, the citation from the House of Representatives. Whereas the House of Representatives of Pennsylvania is recognizing the month of November 2022 as Infant Safe Sleep Month in this Commonwealth, and whereas the children of Pennsylvania are our most important resource and the very foundation of the future of our Commonwealth. Thousands of infants in the United States die each year in preventable tragedies because they are placed in unsafe sleeping environments. In 1994, the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on Sudden Infant Death Syndrome recommended that infants be placed on their backs to sleep. The safest sleeping envir environment for babies is alone on their backs in an empty crib with a tightly fitted sheet and sufficient sleepwear. In 1998, Cribs for Kids a nonprofit organization expanded the message to include the necessity of infant sleeping environments and safe sleep education to families throughout Pennsylvania, which resulted in the passage of Act 73 of 2010. The Back to Sleep message has expanded nationally, and the Cribs for Kids, Cribs for Kids now has more than 1,800 partners participating in the program nationwide. And whereas the website of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development provides parents, grandparents, relatives and daycare providers with access to resources containing information about providing babies with safe sleep environments. The month of November is an opportunity to remind all caregivers to check infant sleep environments to prevent needless tragedies. Now therefore the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania joins with all Pennsylvanians in observing Infant Safe Sleep Month and directs that a copy of this citation sponsored by the Honorable Joe Hamby be presented in recognition of Infant Safe Sleep Month. Thank you. You know, um, we have these proclamations. I want to thank the coroner for taking the initiative to do this in Kate because uh, I got a, a message from Lisa McCloskey who has been here on the breastfeeding. And we've had, uh, we've had proclamations about that. And there's a relationship, a 50% reduction in, uh, based on study done by the American Association of Pediatrics based on SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome with um, breastfeeding either even partial breastfeeding or total breastfeeding and apparently part of it is that the child wakes more often with the breastfeeding which is which is an opportunity for the parents to check so these things are all related and I do think that uh, I do thank you for bringing it up because uh, it does remind us and as you said uh, if it saves one child so absolutely Allie, did you like to say anything? Thanks. did a great job <laughs> 
Thank you. Commissioner Sarr? Um, good. But uh, I want to thank everyone in the coroner's office for uh, you know, taking the time. And it, and it is. We get reports uh, on a weekly basis. So uh, I really want to thank you all for staying so dedicated to the mission of uh, safety and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, this, this topic touches touches home for me because I have a brother who lost his third row to six. She was three months old and uh, it was a tragic time in our, in our family and uh, you know I can still see the pain in her face. She was losing her good little girl that way. So if any way we can prevent this, you know, it's worth the effort. So we want to thank you. For everything we do, we we'll continue to try to educate the public so we can prevent these tragedies. Thanks. Thank you. You get a picture, Joe. <coughs> Two bid openings. Uh, the first one is the Emergency Watershed Protection Pro Project. Um, we got six bids for that. Um, Sylvania Site Company was $540,300. Glen O. Hallbaker, $1,523,000. RHL Companies, $545,841.74. H&T Construction was $687,832. Earthwork Services, $438,097.88. And Darren Thompson Excavating was $478,900. I want to make note, um, we received, Matt Long received a bid at his office for this, which we do not accept paper bids anymore. They must come in on pen bid. I'm not going to open it, but that company was Darren Thompson Excavating as well, which they submitted on Penn Bid. Okay? Okay, thank you. So they, they did submit a bid that it was acceptable and they happened to cover themselves or something? Well, not, we don't know what I'm that is. I'm not sure is. if it's acceptable yet. Um, right. Maya will do her review. So. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then we have the floodplain housing re 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 oh my gosh. Remediation project that's located at 251 Jordan Ave in Montoursville. We received one bid from Elijah at $78,000. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to reports. Kaylin. Uh, accounts payable and then uh, ratification. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Morning. Presented for your ratification are invoices due through November 23rd, 2022, that were paid on November 17th in the amount of $1,664,220.84. The breakdown is as follows, with 39.45% being funded by the general fund at $656,560.35, 25.48% was funded through grants and other sources at $423,958.69, and then 
2007% was funded through RMS at $583,701.80. A motion? I'll move to approve. A second? <coughs> second. Any questions or discussions? And then um, for the ratification for one invoice due November 9th, that was paid November 10th in the amount of $1 million, and this was completely funded through grants and other sources. And that's a pass through the step. And that, yes, that was a pass through for and the that step. That was the ERAP money, right, that we got? Yes. The Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Yes. Okay. And motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to personal actions. Jessica. Morning, Jess. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Director. Good morning. Um, seeking your approval on the following personnel action items as conditional offers of employment subject to the <coughs> success successful completion of background and other employment conditions. For the pre-release center, John Bliss was hired as a resident supervisor full-time replacement at 1718 per hour. Um, he's anticipated to start on November 28th. Okay, got a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. All for side. Aye. Aye. Aye, so carried. At this time we'll recess the commissioner's public meeting for the salary board and we'll the salary board at this time. Seeking your approval on the following salary board action items. For the prison, Ryan Barnes, Deputy Warden of Operations and Security for the prison. Um, there is a pay adjustment for a error in his salary calculation. Motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Nikki seconds. Any questions or discussion? No. Okay, here we go. Go ahead, yeah. Commissioner. Um, I see it, it, it is the 10% adjustment. Is, is that, um, is that what we we were discussing? And, and, I, and I'm going to say why. Okay, my concern is um, when, when we take a look at uh, the other deputy ward, Chris Ebner, and I know he's been here four years longer. I just want Jessica to explain this, that the, the pay, he missed the 10%, which we, which we failed to give him that uh, during that promotion, uh, the additional 10%, it, it's not, um, it still doesn't come up to the amount that I, I, I feel that the division <coughs> was warranted for. It. Am I correct or am I wrong there? Well, I don't want to answer for you, but if I might add, I'm not sure this is so much an error as much as it is that we have two people in the same responsible level of job being paid differently, but not being paid differently because of years of service. There is a difference in years of service between the individuals, but when you take that into account, it doesn't uh, account for it. So if that answers your question, I'm not sure whether it brings, it, brings the person to the point so that there is this kind of the equity issue we've been talking about for months right. and months. So the other thing um, uh, to consider is that we, you know, discussed the compensation policy last week, right? Um, and that uh, the principles of that policy and the formulas of that policy will be also be applied to Ryan as well. So um, there will be an adjustment through that process, um, and then this was just a, an adjustment based on the fact that we had changed the policy and was he should have received the 10 plus 10 percent for the promotion mm -hmm. and actually ryan only got the 10 percent so it is a correction back to that error that had happened we're not retroing payment back to that we're right. just correcting it right now right i mean and right. correct the old policy the old policy only allowed for the 10 percent so right. it's not that we made the error right it, it, it's the fact that we changed the policy after which uh, which we provided a 10 and 10 uh, for, for anybody moving to two pay grades. But, but in this case, and, I, and I'm fine with it as long as we're going to make that correction in that base pay of a deputy ward overall. 
and, and knowing that Chris Ebner's years of service, I mean, uh, in, in this particular case with Ryan Barnes, you will not be making the same as Chris simply because of, of uh, the time that uh, Chris had, but it will be a, uh, an established base rate for the deputy board. Right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Seagraves, but yes. in his current <laughs> salary, he is, he, so we have a warden at the prison, we have two deputies, right? He happens to be the deputy in charge of operations. So he's responsible for the entire prison 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, and in the absence of the warden, he's empowered along with the other deputy to make any decisions necessary that have legal implications and all sorts of things. Am I correct that he's making less than a licensed practical nurse at the prison? Yes, he is. Okay. So there's a gross inequity in what's going on. Obviously, the licensed practical nurse is important, but has a very limited job, passes meds and so forth, responsible just for their shift, goodbye. So we are trying to correct that. And we thank Deputy Barnes for being patient and really exercising an incredible amount of professionalism not to say, hey, this is a real gross inequity that's going on. So we're trying to correct it. And Commissioner Masseri, you're correct. It, it would not be exactly what the other deputy makes, but it would be, uh, it would be uh, comparable. We, we have a situation where we do have two deputies. If you look at the organizational chart, they're equal. You have the warden and you have two deputies. Like you said, he's director of operations. The other deputy is director of treatment. Uh, the responsibilities um, are pretty much the same. Uh, there are 24-7 operations. These gentlemen um, live this on at night and on weekends. However, there is a $24,000 difference in salaries. And because of when he was promoted, he went from a 9 to a 12 pay grade. He went back to the beginning of the pay grade, the 12, without giving consideration to his years of service. And this is what this new compensation policy addresses. It addresses these inconsistencies in these situations. Mm -hmm. So he would have been credited for those years of service, which would have brought him more in line with the other deputy at that time. So, so well, I want to thank you. I also want to thank Ryan. Ryan has never complained. <coughs> he continues to do his duties. And we want to thank him for uh, uh, bearing with us. And uh, as we make this adjustment, and uh, get him properly compensated for, for what he's been doing for the years to serve. The only question which we never answered, which Commissioner Masseri asked is, does this readjustment bring him to the place where he should be absent the years, vis-a-vis -vis the other deputy, absent the year difference? Um, I, 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 we You're hadn't sure. had that conversation okay. before, I think, I, before I think this. The market, so. study, the market study of what other fifth class deputies get across the state will help answer that yeah i haven't i haven't done a, a look at that at this yeah. time okay but i, well, I do know that, that there's an additional adjustment that would be um for ryan through the compensation policy analysis that we did too so gotcha. okay. between this and that i i feel that it is going to bring him into that range that we would be more comfortable with okay. being not, comparable to chris you're right and not only is an lpn making more money his entire staff above him, or beneath him, I'm sorry, beneath him, that he supervises are actually making more Not money. the entire staff, but there's quite a few of the um, individuals that report to him that, I, I that should, are making more yeah, than I need him. to correct that because yes. we have new people in those right. mm -hmm. sergeant roles. Yes. But previously with the previous lieutenants, the previous sergeants. It was all of them. It was all of them. Right. But now we've had a few retire. Correct. So it is a few that are less. Mm -hmm. Right. But we still have some that are making more. Yes, yeah. four. Four. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Do we? Do you need a vote? We yeah, vote? we need a okay. vote. Okay. So I have a, a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. And at this time, we'll convene the salary board. I mean, adjourn the salary board, and reconvene the commissioner's public meeting at this time. Okay, um, moving on to information items, I'll be taking Maya's uh, item. She's at the house. <clears throat> um, we're just acknowledging that the county will be requesting bids for bread products for the prison 2023 budget item. Uh, 6.2 and 6.3, Jason York. 
Yes, sir. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Commissioners, uh, information item 6.2, This we will be going out to bid for landfill SCADA system. Uh, before I can explain, the SCADA system is basically a full monitoring system through fiber optics. All our pumps, uh, control panels, everything uh, will be communicating to us. We'll be able to maintain and monitoring pump usage, which we have a significant amount of pumps just surrounding the landfill itself. We already make use of SCADA system with sewer plants. They monitor our systems. So uh, we'll be going out to bid. Uh, it'll be due January 6th and we'll be opening January 12th. Um, 6.3, we are also going to be going out for what we're considered site utilities modification bid. The dates are going to be the same for that. This is going to be for a ton of tidy up work. Uh, when Montgomery got the water line and the tank, we have to put in a valve. We have some force mains we've got to replace and do. Just generally a lot of site work around the landfill. Both of these will be funded through closure funds. Okay, thank you, Jason. Okay, moving on to 6.4. We're gonna get a white gear golf course update from Chris Train. Morning, Chris. Good morning, Commissioners, Director. Um, just want to give a little, um, thank everyone for their time. Just want to give a little update to uh, White Deer and how we did this season. Uh, a little over 50,000 rounds. Tell them who you are, because oh, people sorry. watching this may not know who Chris sure, Strand sure. is. Uh, Chris Strand, I'm a um, uh, regional manager for True and Golf, uh, the manager company that oversees White Deer Golf Course. A um, little over 50,000 rounds, which is where we've been the last couple of years. Um, this summer had a lot of playable days, so the summer was good. I know drought, not good for grass and those types of things, but good for golf courses because <laughs> we can do a lot more rounds without rainy days. Um, membership is strong as ever. Um, what's been really nice though is being able to get back to doing outings. You know, with COVID, they've kind of put groups and gatherings and stuff on the back burner for a little bit of time. Um, so we've been able to do a lot more outings again, which obviously helps us from a revenue standpoint, but also does a, a tremendous job with fundraising. Uh, for a lot of local charities um, and for the local community um, for events that we host at, at White Deer. So it's nice getting those back because I know it does uh, raises a tremendous amount of money for the local area. Um, but the biggest news, of course, is also um, you know, the golf course is in good financial position. Uh, we're self-sustaining now. I know there was years past where there was a lot of talk about that, but you know we've now gone, I think, five years without borrowing any money. Um, and you know we're covering all our operations, all our improvements, uh, all our equipment needs, uh, which are always ever going. But um, you know this year we did some irrigation repairs, drainage work, car path work, worked on our HVAC systems at the clubhouse, uh, some range updates, uh, did quite a bit of stuff, and all that's been funded by our own operations. Um, we're going to make the full uh, cart payment again um, just now uh, at the end of the season, so that's still right on track. And uh, fully expect after we get through winter that we'll be having a discussion in the spring to kick back some funds again to the county like we did last year. Um, you know, but try to get through winter first when we don't have any revenue coming in, but make sure that we're in good shape. But um, fully expect we'll be in a good position like we were uh, last year to do so. So all good on, on White Deer's front. Um, Want to again thank the commissioners for all your support over the last few years to help us get there. Um, you know, but it's been a tremendous success story and, and doing very well now. So Chris, three years ago when I was knocking on all the doors I knocked on to ask them to vote for me, one of the major complaints I heard was, get rid of the golf course, get rid of the golf course. It's a money pit, it's killing us. We haven't heard that the last three years. Okay, what we've done is turn this project around. For, for the people out there to think we can just sell the golf course, it's not that easy because that course was provided by the federal monies. We found out, because right now we're in the process of trying to work out a situation where we can sell some of the acreage around the golf course, which is tied to the golf course, which is the back part, the, um, the part three and the, in the front, which we like to sell for additional housing in the county. What we found out was that 
they had borrowed, well, they didn't borrow, they accepted $20,000 in federal monies back in 1978. It's tied all 425 acres. So we're, we averted a, a disaster in our county that happened in Berks County. Berks County put up a $10 million building. Found out after the fact, had to go out and do a land swap, which they didn't have land. They had to go out and buy land for recreational purposes to do the land swap in order to satisfy what was to be satisfied. So we're right now in the process of doing that swap so that we can do that. We're waiting on the Department of Forestry to, to respond to us. We, we're, we're getting positive signs that we can do that. But in the meantime, the two courses that are over there have provided their own means to support what is a, an asset in the county. It's an asset in the county for people who want to come here and, and golf for people that reside here and like to take up the sport. So what we have done is we've loaned you money. We basically bought the cards. And for all the haters out there that I see on a regular basis, that commissioners give money to the golf carts. Mm -hmm. They give money to this, they give money to the airport. Let's get the facts straight. The facts are those carts cost 400,000 bucks. The fact is you agreed, your, your employment has agreed to pay that back 50,000 per year. This is payment number two right. and you're right on target. Right. What we did do is we had to buy patio furniture that we took out legacy money because the patio furniture was 20 years old. <laughs> it was falling apart. We don't need people sitting down and falling in the, and suing the county. So we did take money out of that to buy new patio furniture. That's the only thing I can think of besides the bond payment, which we're responsible for. Right. But it's nice to have you guys there, that you're doing a good job, you're improving the course, you have money in the bank, and you're paying what you agreed to pay to the county back. And those are those cards. Yeah, correct. So and hopefully kick back some extras as we go along. That'd be beautiful. Last year, <laughs> last year you kicked back an extra 25000 Correct. Which was nice. So this is a positive thing that we need to market. To shut down those haters out there that keep spreading mistruths mm -hmm. that this course is still costing the county a ton of money. Right. It is not. Yeah, we have our debt service that we're paying, it, which, which is, you know, but we've raided the ship. It was a disaster at one time. You know, you came in with three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, and that got paid, and now you're turning it into where it's self-sustained. Yeah. We pray God to God for many more beautiful summers <laughs> right. that we don't have rain. You know, for all, all all kinds of reasons, including my swimming pool <laughs> for the kids. So. But with that said, we want to thank you for doing a good job and, and taking care of your obligations to the county and, and your staff over there. We have Justin here, um, you know, um, the people that, that come to us that are customers over there, we want to hear them because they're, they're paying the bill through memberships. We want to hear them and listen to what we can do to improve the course. And we bring those concerns to you guys. And, uh, and I believe you guys, are, you can't address everything at one time. But you're addressing one by one. Right. I mean, it's been a lot different story the last few years, having some money in the bank and having, you know, some ideas of, okay, how can we keep continual improvements to keep up with the needs at the golf course, but not having to go back to ask for anything, right. you know? So it's been, uh, been a, a lot, lot of fun over the last few years to go, all right, how, how can we kind of keep this going? So for the ones that sit there and say, the commissioners bought $400,000 worth of golf carts and, you know, they keep dumping money in over there, that's not true. We did give you $400,000 worth of monies, but you're paying them back. And you're doing that responsibly, and that's been it. You guys, you come to us with a budget every year. You're going by that budget, and it's working. That's a nice big block number now. Yeah, that's yes. nice. <laughs> so, Chris, the lease for the golf courts <coughs> is in the county's name, right? right. So we did spend $400,000 on golf courts. Yeah, we did. They, they are a management company. They have no liability for the golf courts. If the golf cart payment isn't made, we're responsible, the taxpayers. The commissioners felt that in this instance, financially, it was better for us to front certain funds that we were getting practically no interest on rather than 
doing a different arrangement. We looked at all the arrangements. How much cash is in the bank today? Uh, $410,000. Okay. So there's $410,000 in the bank. Now some people may say, well, why don't we just turn that over to the county? Because the, we're trying to get, and that, by the way, that 410000 is all money that's come from revenue from people playing golf. That's where it's come from. What people are upset about is the fact that, the truth be told, over however many years you want to look at it, the county has put millions of dollars into the golf course. I mean, that's, that's the truth. But we, or uh, certainly I remember the very first time I came in December I was at a meeting at the golf course oh, with the director and and uh, I, I of course said this was at state almost eight years ago constituents said, why don't you close the golf course etc cetera, etc cetera. I do give credit to Commissioner Masser for both having a uh, a dogged determination and a belief that the golf course was something that was positive for this community and I grew to understand that positive perspective not just for our our uh, our uh, charity uh, nonprofits but for our constituents to not have to join a country club if they want to play golf just like if you want to play basketball you can go to a basketball court does everyone play golf no but if some of our kids get interested if some of our seniors get interested if it's a way to make our community have a quality of life that says Someone says, I'm going to come and stay in Lycoming County because I have things. Some people hike and walk on the trail. Some people play in our parks. Some people play golf. Some people go to the Community Arts Center. The point is, some people ride the Hiawatha. The point is to have enough things going on in our community that people say, I want to be there. Now, you have to balance that against not having the taxpayers constantly fronting money and uh, and that's where the management company has done a good job of trying to uh, be efficient make the uh, make the uh, the course really a place that people want to go to and this isn't to say that the people who were involved in the past didn't do a good job but it's a full-time job it is not it is hard just for volunteers to run the course it's like any organization so so the money in the bank belongs to the taxpayers, but it's more prudent now to leave it in the bank. They paid us some money last year, I think $25,000. we are looking forward, what does that mean, they paid us? They transferred money that the taxpayers had there into the general fund, with the goal being that over time, <clears throat> we will replace all the money that the taxpayers put out to make this asset. It's going to take a long time. We hope that you will continue to make the course successful. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I do. I, I think Commissioner Masser has stuck in there. He's gone down to the course. He's he's really put heart and soul into it. And and he, when I came in, he asked both Commissioner McKernan and me to basically go with what he saw was a plan. And and we did that. And it's and it's worked out. So uh, and we're continuing to do that. And we monitor it. And we meet monthly with them. And. Um, so I just want the public to understand that. It is hard sometimes. I think what also is hard is when the public sometimes sees us not putting money in some place, but they feel like the money is being put in other places. And that's where we as policymakers have to make sure that we are equitable and exercise some <coughs> wisdom in distributing funds all over. And we, we try to do that. So, but thank you. And I know you have your assistant here too. You should introduce. One good point you brought up, and, and Chris mentioned too, the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that goes to the local charities by having tournaments over there, and, and that benefits the entire community. And uh, you know that's that's been a major, major asset. Yeah. Um, Justin, would you like to come up? While you're coming up, Commissioner Massar, would you like to say anything? We want to thank you for your, your leadership on this project too. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, couldn't have done it without the other uh, two colleagues, though, uh, believing in uh, the management company as well. And even though it's been difficult at times, you know, with uh, the, the commissioners and Chris, uh, I, I think I think it's a great, uh, it, it was a great partnership. I also want to tell Chris that there's a new owner, uh, Clinton uh, County Country Club, and he will be a, a, a competitor on a very uh, 
a very good one. So um, I want you to keep that in your mind, that uh, any improvements within the golf course that, that is funded through the proceeds that you receive, not from county any longer, uh, you, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, he's he's going to put a, a, a lot of money into that golf course up there. Just so the public knows, it, I'm sorry, but at one point we did talk in the last the last board spoke to some people about buying the golf course and the amount of money they wanted to give us for the course was it, it was was ridiculous. It would have been it would have been giving away uh, your half million dollar house for uh, fifty thousand dollars. So we just decided, yeah, it just didn't make any sense, and that we couldn't go to the taxpayers and say, hey. This is what we're doing. So I think we we made the right decision. Justin Lake Sandy. Not really. Tell uh, them who you are, Justin. My name is Justin Dahin. I'm the general manager at Wager Golf Course. I work for Troon uh, with Chris. Um, with his guidance, he kind of helps me run the day-to-day -day on site at White Deer. So I'm pretty much the one that's there. If anybody ever needs anything, they can come find me, ask for me, and, and we will make sure we do everything we can to take care of what needs to be taken care of. And I've been here two years now. It's been a pleasure to work there. It's been a pleasure to work with Chris and obviously the commissioners and everybody else. And we hope for more good years to come. This is an asset that belongs to the people of Lacoming County. Absolutely. And uh, we should be proud sure. to have it. And we should hope that we can make it continue to work for future generations. <coughs> and we, we thank you for the beauty of the course, keeping the course. And we hope to uh, make the transaction here in the future with what be around the course and um, bring some beautiful homes there yeah. that uh, maybe some of those members of uh, some of those residents will become members also. And you know, it's interesting because we have a proposal and they're building houses up around the other golf course. Yep. The country club, with yep. there's a proposal to do that, so. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll recess Commissioner's Club meeting for the Board of Assessments revisions at this time. We'll convene the board with assessments revisions. Brooke? Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm seeking your approval for a real estate tax refund closed department in the amount of $2,423.51. This is a result of a real estate appeal that was decided by a court order. Okay, I have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All in favor. Any discussion? So the only thing I, Chris, um, Brooke, just for the public, real quick, explain when you say it's by court order. Explain the procedure of what happened that got calls, got us to the point where the court is basically saying you're going to reduce it. Um, what happens is they filed an appeal. It went before the Board of Assessment. And in this situation, the Board of Assessment did not like their appraisal, so they denied it. And then they get a decision order, and they have 30 days to file an appeal with the Court of Common Pleas, which they did. And then we would, we came back with a new value for them. They came back with a value, and we negotiated a little bit. Cause we don't like to go to court if we don't have to, and that's how we end up settling with the court order. Okay, so this was a result of a negotiated settlement, a settlement after they filed for, to have their case heard by, by a judge. And the judge then ratified the settlement that the parties had reached, and that's what you're bringing us today. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And and the basis of their their um, original case was that the value of their property had declined based on the appraisal they brought in. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. You're welcome, Commissioner. All favor, say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Brooke. You're welcome. We'll adjourn the Board of Assessments at this assessment revisions at this time and and um, we'll recess that for the community development block grant public hearing. We'll convene the public hearing. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm gonna introduce Nathan Carter. He's morning, Nathan. going to be taking over the Lycoming County C D B G program. I'm gonna be transitioning it to him. So I'm gonna let him handle this. I'm gonna be here in case he needs any help. But Great. Turning it over. Thank you, Nate. Good morning, Commissioners. Director. Um, my name is Nathan Carter. I'm a new hire at CDCOG, so I'll just be going through um, our public hearing for the budget modification on 
financial year 2020 CV funds. Um, this was also in the agenda that is available on the back um, if you'd like to follow along. But at this time, we would like to approve the following changes or modifications to the budget. First, uh, Jersey Shore American Rescue Workers um, was a project that is now complete and the change in budget is being directed to the CIL um, Center for Independent Living uh, HVAC project. Um, the total amount changing from that project to the CIL project is $24,014. Also, Jersey Shore's supportive housing program, um, a change of $22,143.06 is being directed from Jersey Shore supportive housing to the CIL rooftop air conditioning project. Excuse me one second. Can you speak a little louder? Just speak for the people on the phone. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Microphone. Um, additionally, the Montoursville American Rescue Workers Project is also having funds redirected. Um, the total amount changed from that project to the CIL project is $8,961.50. Um, lastly, the Montoursville Supportive Housing Program has a change of $7,659.13 being directed to the CIL Rooftop Air Conditioning Unit Project. Um, are there any public comments or questions at this time? <clears throat> okay. Um, we'd like to approve the submission of this budget modification certification to the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. All right. If there are no other public comments at this time, we can go ahead and move on to the next section or action items. Okay, thank you. Hearing no more public comment, we'll adjourn the public hearing at this time. Okay. We'll be in the public meeting. All right. Action items. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so in terms of um, voting to approve on the budget modification certification, we just discussed that. Um, motion to approve. Okay. Motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any questions or discussions for Nathan? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 So carry. Okay. Thank you. So moving a couple on. of others. Yeah, it's a few other ones. Back three. Mr. Chairman, I will move to approve 9.2, 9.3, and 9.4. <laughs> That's acceptable. I would be very I'm pleased. That motion. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Do you want us to uh, review what the revisions are, or for the public? I, I think that's that's important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So okay. you would just go over what the revisions are and what the PSA is. So our revisions um, to can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Oh, could, 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 you, mute could you mute your phone, please? Okay. Commissioner, can you mute, mute your phone, please? I, I am trying to do so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No worries. Um, so our revision to the PSA um, effectively changes the, um, or adds some additional fees to projects in 2019 funding. Um, the total amounts that is being changed um, is the application preparation and activity selection um, for a total of $31,406. Um, grant administration, which is $27,406. Uh, activity development, $41,969. And activity management of $30,809. For a total amount of uh, $131,590. Um, that is the administrative and delivery services. Are there any questions on that? It's actually to add the delivery fees for the new projects that were added in 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's adding the environmental review and the labor standards to your 2019 contract for those, 
the John Doran restroom project and the curb cuts in South Williamsport that you took action to add previously. So these are not fees going to CEDACOG? No, well, this is a part of our professional services, but that, that has been in place for years. We are just adding the new project delivery fees to do the environmental review and the labor standards enforcement. We are not adding all those new fees. Right. But you have to... You have to do these reviews by law. Yes, these right. are these so are required by your grant contract by right. the federal government. So we're actually adding the four thousand dollars for the the John Doran restroom project, the four thousand for the new curb cuts, and then um, the labor standards enforcement, which is thirty one hundred for each of those projects. And Every time we have a new project, we have to add delivery. Is the labor standards enforcement the uh, uh, prevailing wage? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. All the prevailing wage things and the interviews and everything like that. Yes. Okay. Yep. And then we're doing um, two revisions. So just want to let them know what's being revised quickly. So 18 and 20. Okay, y'all. Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Um, in terms of revisions to the budget um, for financial year 2018 funding, um, 7th Avenue reconstruction is um, changing the budget from $82,361 to $77,741. That extra $4,620 um, is getting returned. It's getting into the Center for Independent mm -hmm. Living Air Conditioning Project. And that will increase the cost, of, or not increase the cost, but increase the budget of the CIL rooftop air conditioning unit project uh, to $15,000 and 410 um, instead of $10,790. Um, that is one of the changes. Are there any questions on that so far? No. Okay. Um, the other revision. is our John Doran Municipal Building Restroom RAB. Um, the change is going to be a total of $40,330.84. And um, that will increase from an original budget of zero. Additionally, we have the Montoursville Curb Cuts Phase 4 project, which um, is decreasing its budget from $71,743 um, to $31,412.16. Lastly, we have our uh, South Williamsport Curb Cuts Phase 1 uh, project, which is increasing to $30,536. And we did discuss the Habitat for Humanity acquisition. Um, these are all included in the financial year 2020 uh, budget revision. Are there any further questions or comment at this time, public? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor for action items 9.2 through 9.4, say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Nathan. All right. Thank you and welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. And Jamie, good luck. Yes, yeah, thank you, Jamie. For I'm staying. I'm just transitioning like coming county from one person to another <laughs> just in the middle <laughs> we had chris for so many years it was <clears throat> yeah hard to He's still yep <laughs> nope we're going to move to 9.12 9.12 okay of course oh, okay. good morning commissioners good morning uh, so this is an item that was already discussed and approved at a public board of elections meeting. This is now on a board of commissioners agenda as well, and it is to uh, approve, I hope, an increase to the annual compensation for polling place facilities in the county. It has been uh, the same uh, at the current rate of $125 per year. As long as I have been here, I don't know how much further back it goes, so we're talking about 10 years or more, uh, which is a long time to stay at the rate that it is. Uh, previously, uh, I'd always advocated for our, our poll workers. You know, We were trying to get them additional compensation, and uh, they obviously did another great job for us in the election, 
if you know a poll worker, please thank them. They're wonderful people that their job is getting more difficult and complicated all the time. But the other part of the equation that uh, we are finally circling back around to are the facilities because we absolutely need them as well. Uh, these are fantastic places where people go to vote. They're fire halls, uh, the township buildings, other institutions, civic organizations all over the map. They welcome us in, they let, they let our voters in and our poll workers so that democracy can play out twice a year. But the 125 a year just is, uh, you know, it needs to be looked at. And the Board of Elections previously approved an update to that where the facilities would be paid $500 per year, uh, keeping in mind they host two elections each year. So if by some chance a facility only hosts one election because we have to do a change, they would just be paid 250 uh, but if they're hosting for the whole year it would be 500 and those monies would be paid out of act 88 it would so yeah i mean it's it's it, it's county it's it's county money act 88 dollars are coming into the county uh, act 88 of 2022 is a new grant program the the state the commonwealth allocated an annual amount of money about 45 million dollars and that is that will be divided between the counties each year uh, as a percentage of how many of our registered voters uh, compared to the state's registered voters. So that amount that we have each year could float, but this is the type of expenditure <coughs> that Act 88 grant dollars would uh, would provide for. And I believe, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I believe the amount was 365. This, this year it was 366,000. It's a little complicated because the Act 88 grants operate on the state's finance uh, fiscal year so uh, the the act was passed over the summer the first uh, year of it started in July and uh, monies were actually deposited in late August early September and then it goes to June so you know rather than a county year or an election year you might think of where you have a primary in a November the act 88 funding cycle would be the November election and the primary the following year so it makes makes the budgeting a little bit haywire but we're we're working it out yeah. we talked about how complicated it is to have three fiscal calendars the federal the state and the county and yes um, very very difficult yes but it's yeah. good to have the money too so yeah. <laughs> we won't turn the money down yeah I have a motion? I move to approve. Second? Second. Any further questions for reports? No, I think it's worth making a comment here about something that's coming up that I think we should reconsider. You know, you, you Forest Star, and your department is extremely busy. You, you have a Department of Justice uh, situation going on where they basically have told us that uh, how many polling places are not in compliance? A lot, right? Well, ultimately, they're going to ask us to look at everything. At everything, right. Yes. So the Department of Justice goes around and makes sure that people actually can go vote because they have access, right? So if I'm in a wheelchair and the only way to get into the place to vote is through steps, I don't really have access to vote, right? Uh, I mean, it's more difficult. I have to, either have to have someone there to take me up in the wheelchair or I have to have, right, if there's no ramp. And... Um, <coughs> I, I'm concerned that, you know, we, we had this vote a couple of uh, weeks ago to recount the 2020 election ballots, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take attention of this office and of the people who work in this office, and I'm really not sure that it's a prudent uh, use of our time, and frankly, I, I'm concerned because these polling places issues are complicated. We've met with the school superintendents because we've, we've, uh, have, we have, you know, by law we're able to use certain schools. So I, I think, commissioners, that we should think about this. We, uh, we only have 24 hours in a day, and our employees don't work 24 hours in a day. They work eight hours in a day. And um, I, I have real concerns about the ability of this office to do everything that needs to be done when um, and constituents have told me this I am voicing what constituents have told me so we don't have to have an extended conversation but I just think it's worth noting that these that in addition to all the work they do normally with making sure that the poll or uh, the uh, list of uh, purged 
making sure that the registrations and all the things that go on on a day-to-day -day basis, they now have this Department of Justice action that is a serious action because if we don't respond and do what is expected, I correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Solicitor, but I imagine the Department of Justice could act as a receiver and come in and say, if you're not capable of doing it, we're going to do it and we're going to, you know, we'll send you the bill at the end of the day. Uh, there would be that potential. Right. And that could be very, very expensive. I mean, I'm talking about five, six million dollars. So I just hope that we will think about it and, you know, weigh the wisdom of doing one thing versus doing something else. So. Your comments are Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie. I'm going to add something. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner. Maybe the solicitor can, uh, you know, when it comes to ADA compliance, um, is it having mail in ballots part of that equation? Could, could be somebody where, where you're not in a, um, a, a precinct that is ADA compliant as far as them getting up to you up to the second floor? Would, would mail-in ballots be an option for those people that or, or not? That's, that's one question. Uh, the second, and it would be more of a comment to Commissioner Marabito, is that um, when we're talking about the recount, it isn't a, a popular uh, decision that we made, uh, not whatsoever. I mean, uh, if I'm just looking at from a political point of view, I've had just as many Republicans come up to me and say, geez, I don't know why you're doing that, uh, Commissioner Macera. And, and the, the bottom line is this, and there were some editorials in the paper of, uh, about this as well, and um, it certainly wasn't appreciated by me, but when you have X amount of constituents that are asking for something, this isn't about whether Donald Trump won or not. This is about equipment. And then if you want to really get into it all, yes, any machine can be hacked. And it doesn't have to go through the and it doesn't have to go through the internet. Now, Commissioner Metzger and I aren't, aren't arguing that President Biden isn't the winner or that Trevor, President or uh, past President Trump wasn't the loser. There was question as far as are the counters correct? with the ballots, paper ballots. That's why we have paper ballots. And when the editorial says the commissioners know nothing about this, know nothing about that, know nothing about this, it was highly offensive to me. I didn't respond to it, but I will now. Is, is that we did know. Forrest does count those uh, counters. He does do a paper ballot check was just limited. He knows what he wants to implement. It's the amount of people that may be needed to, to con condense the time within two days. Okay? Um, I still, unless, unless, and we have some in information that there could be a, a lawsuit against us that wants a forensic audit. If that is the case, then Commissioner Maravito, I'm all for saying forget it, okay? I, I'm not going to go through two things um, but, and then just let it up to the court by, by this group of people. But if they want them both, I will, I will come back to the uh, Board of Elections and, and rescind that, uh, that count. Anything more, Commissioner? No, I'm finished. Okay, I'll just make a brief comment. To address, to address the Commissioner Massar's question, while mail-in ballots provide an alternative method for all voters, it does not supplant the need to have accessible polling places. Thank you. I'll, I'll just make a brief comment because I don't want to get away from what our action item is here, but uh, I'll, I'm the one who made the motion. And I made the motion because it's not a question of saying Joe Biden's not a president and Donald Trump should have won the election. That's not it. That election's been decided. It's been decided. Got to move on. 
The reason why I made the motion is because of voter integrity. We have people believing that the tabulators don't match the ballots in this county. And we got to put that to bed to show them once and for all the tabulators match the ballots. We got great poll workers, we got great voters registration, we got great poll watchers. Everybody, if people would have been there on November the 8th this year and stood outside, and, and actually there was, there was a member of the Democratic Party that was a, a watcher there that stood in the hallway that night, and she complimented how beautiful the process was. She was impressed with it. And, uh, and everybody working as a team. Um, so that's the reason why we're doing this. And, it, and the, the argument that, well, you're going to open up Pandora's box and people are going to come back and say, I want to recount. No, we're going to show them that it's right in Lycoming County. The tabulators match the ballots. And if for some reason it doesn't, then we'll correct it. But I have complete confidence it's going to show that it was accurate. And then we can restore voter confidence and we can have the people move on. We need to move on. And it, this is a process. When I, when I heard the Commissioner, still there? yeah, Commissioner, let me finish. When I when I saw the paper saying we don't have a plan, we do have a plan. That day, if you recall, I started reading the steps. I started read, reading the steps that was handed to us by Forrest of how we would start to do this. Now we don't know how many people it's going to involve. We don't know that yet. But we had the process started. We knew what we were going to start to do. <coughs> and from my understanding, we can take Act 88 monies to help pay for that. I, I doubt that. You doubt that? I mean, the, the solicitor could would have to okay, review well, that. Okay, we'll re research that. Act 88 would be for prospective for elections. For it doesn't future. fall within okay. the, that reporting period. But the, w we have county employees now that help us in this process, and I believe we can do the same thing and get this done in a very short period of time. With the steps the force has already given us, and and basically we're going to follow the same two percent process that you're going forward with now, because you you've, you're starting that process right now, aren't you? I believe you we, said by by Friday you'd be starting. We're waiting on the state to uh, move forward with its its part of the risk limiting audit. So once they randomly select batches for the counties to uh, audit as part of the statewide effort then we'll be able to move forward with our part of it afterward. Right. And, but you had, that was the process you had described that you wanted to use? Yes. Okay. And that's the, the process I would recommend that we use. So what we're going to be using forward going through with the 2%, that type of the recount process is the same process we should use with this. Yeah. This is a one-time thing. Right. It's two offices <clears throat> and that's it. Right. But we're counting. The only point I wanted to make is, I, I didn't want to rehash the whole no. issue. All I'm yeah. trying to say is that we've got a Department of Justice I case going yes. on that potentially could cost the taxpayers like six million dollars and we also have a group of people who want us to recount by hand every ballot for the 2020 election and all I'm suggesting is that before we get sidetracked with that and I'm not minimizing the people or their concerns or anything but what I'm saying is that if the taxpayers end up getting slapped with a six million dollar bill because we don't have the time to do what we need to do to comply with the Department of Justice we are going to have a lot of unhappy taxpayers. And to spend, t and what I'm trying to say is we, this man and his staff only have so many hours in a day that they can do the job. And so we have to make some priorities. That's all I was trying to say. And that I think in light of what we three have gone through in the last five or six days around the issue of the DOJ, mm -hmm. that it's brought to my mind that it's even more important for us to maybe say, guess what? We may not be able to do this hand count in January. That, that's all I'm trying to say. So that we're not putting a burden on employees that some of them just say, you know what, goodbye, <laughs> can't do this anymore. And that we, that's all. And, and it came to light to me in the last five or six days in terms of the meetings and the discussions we've had around this DOJ issue. So that's the only thing I'm asking us to, to think about. Okay. Yeah. I can't put a price, price tag on, on voter confidence. Sorry. Uh, that's, that's a ridiculous argument. Uh, voter confidence is paramount. Across the country, you're seeing people upset about how things are done. I, I'll ask Forrest a question right now. Forrest, when I get online, or somebody gets online to, to uh, register to vote through the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, 
uh, are, and they can check the box. They can check the box that they're a citizen. Do you verify that? Well, you're, so there's two different mechanisms you're talking about there. One is the motor voter process at a, at a PennDOT facility. The online process is an online registration process through Pennsylvania Department of State. So, so it's one or the other. Do they, do they verify that they're a citizen? Uh, so the voter has to make an indication. Uh, there is an ID check that is performed when those applications come in against PennDOT records. That does happen for every application. If there was an issue with the ID check, then the county would have uh, have some additional review to do. Yeah. And in other words, there's many things that are are being discussed that are you know on both sides, not just the Republicans. On, on voter integrity, and and I believe that it's it's first and foremost, in my opinion, that especially in like Cumming County, where we feel absolutely certain that everything's fine, but but when I have five thousand signatures, or we have thirty-five, and then it was five thousand signatures. I think I'm listening. I am listening, 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 and DOJ. Uh, demand on us to be com uh, can be compliant. That's going to happen regardless of whether we count or not. And I'll, I'll add to that, Commissioner. When we, we live in the most powerful country in the world, when we have to wait a week, hmm. a week to find out how the house is controlled, hmm. we got Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, California still counting ballots. Luzerne County last night still counting ballots. American Idol can have five million votes <laughs> and have them counted within hours. <laughs> in hours! And we can't count ballots in this country. Florida had seven and a half million votes counted by 9 p.m. They had a major issue there 20 years ago. They fixed it. We got to fix it or the voter confidence is going to be destroyed. It's going downhill now. So with that said, we'll move on and, and we'll ask for a vote. Uh, um, uh, did we do a motion? Yeah. Aye. Yeah. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 So carry. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. thank you for it. Um, I'll take Jessica's too here. She wasn't aware of the Shandy's too. Um, and I'm going to do them together. Uh, seeking approval for the 2023 health benefits policy renewal with Trustmark. Uh, this is a budgeted 2023 budget item at $925,648.50. Uh, along with that, um, seeking the approval of the 2023 administrative renewal services and fees uh, with Trustmark. Uh, also a budget item at 504463 dollars And I just want to make a note that these are the two main costs of our health insurance plan. Um, and then, obviously, health insurance is a lot more expensive than that because we are uh, self-funded, so we pay as we go. So we pay the claims as they come. Okay, motion. I'll, I'll, I'll move to approve. I'll second. Aye. 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 So carried. <clears throat> Commissioners, um, seeking your approval on resolution 2022-23 to implement Act 57 of 2022 property tax penalty waiver provisions. Um, we are required to enact a resolution or correct, adopt a resolution or ordinance within 90 days of the effective date of the act, um, which was signed into law by the governor uh, on 11 July of 2022 and takes effect 10 October. Um, do you want me to read through the whole resolution or? Yeah, it's a resolution. Okay. All right. 
A resolution of the Board of Commissioners of Lycoming County to implement Act 57 of 2022, whereas Act 57 of 2022, amending the local tax collection law, was signed by Governor Wolf on July 11, 2022, and takes effect on October 10, 2022, and whereas Act 57 requires taxing districts that impose taxes on the assessed value of real property to adopt a resolution or ordinance within 90 days of the effective date of the act or not later than January 9, 2023, directing the tax collector to waive additional charges for real estate taxes in certain situations. And now therefore be it resolved that the tax collectors of Lycoming County comply with the provisions of Act 57 and this resolution for tax years beginning on or af after January, January 1, 2023. Definitions. The following words and phrases shall have the meanings given to them within the res this resolution unless the context clearly indicates otherwise. Additional charge. Any interest, fee, penalty, or charge accruing to and in excess of the face amount of the real estate tax as provided in the real estate tax notice. Qualifying event, one, for the purposes of real property, the date of transfer of ownership. Two, for manufacturer of mobile homes, the date of transfer of ownership or the date a lease agreement commences for the original location or relocation of a manufactured or mobile home on a parcel of land not owned by the owner of the manufactured or mobile home. The term does not include the renewal of a lease for the same location. Tax collector. The elected tax collectors for Lycoming County, any authorized or designated delinquent tax collector for Lycoming County, Tax Claim Bureau, or any alternative collector of taxes as provided for in the Act of July 7, 1947, PL 1, uh, 1368, number 542, known as the Real Estate Tax Sale Law, an employee, agent, or assign, assignee authorized to collect the tax, purchaser of claim for the tax, or any other person authorized by law or contract to secure a collection of, or take any action at law or inequity against the person or property of the taxpayer for real estate tax or amounts, liens or claims derived from the real estate tax. Waiver. The tax collector shall, for tax years beginning on and after January 1, 2023, grant a request to waive additional charges for real estate taxes if the taxpayer does all of the following. A. Provides a waiver request of additional charges on a form provided by the State Department of Community and Economic Development to the tax collector in possession of the claim within 12 months of a qualifying event. B. Attests that a tax notice was not received. And C. Provides a tax collector in possession of the claim with one of the following. A copy of the deed showing the date of real property transfer or two, a copy of the title following the acquisition of a mobile or manufactured home subject to taxation as real estate, showing the date of issuance or a copy of an executed <coughs> lease agreement between the owner of a mobile or manufactured home and the owner <coughs> of the person of land on which the mobile or manufactured home will be situated, showing the date the lease commences. And D, pays the face value amount of the tax notice for real estate tax with the waiver request. Adopted uh, by the Lycoming County Commissioners <coughs> the 17th day of November, 2022. Okay, thank you. Now there'll be a test on that five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean, Matt? <laughs> Means if you provide the, the uh, proper documentation, you can have any uh, late fees waived. Okay. How's that sound? <laughs> I, like, I like the shorter version. <laughs>
right, uh, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll take it. All fair side. Aye. 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 <coughs> Fun reading. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to 9.8. Uh, seeking your approval to or vote to approve the redevelopment assistance capital program uh, rack pain funding grant award for old like old city Williamsport mixed use development project <coughs> in Lycoming <coughs> County. Um, and just a note here. Um, Delta Development uh, will administer the grant. We'll work on the, the full application and compliance process in coordination with the county. And work on the projects will be paid out of Delta's contract with the county that they already have. Um, it will not be paid from, let's say, <coughs> and then Delta's work on the Old City Williamsport project, the other section of it, or portion of it, will not be paid out of our contract. So they're going to keep it separate. We had a quarterly meeting yesterday with the Old City um, Development uh, folks up at the college, and it's exciting to hear that the first phase is going to be started here in the spring. And it should be play, completed by what they say August, Commissioner? Is it August? So there'll be some exciting changes up in, uh, in that area of the, of the city. We, we thank the governor and we thank Senator Yaw uh, for for pushing to get this RCAP funding for us. Um, million dollars. Million dollars. You know, we know the county committed a million dollars uh, to. Uh, the development of the <coughs> garage there uh, and one of the things we emphasized yesterday was that we wanted to make sure that the garage was taxable that the uh, <coughs> that when it's finally uh, you know if it got turned over to an authority or something like that it might lose its tax status but initially it may have some public status to be able to funnel the month of money but there's an understanding that will be on the tax rolls and then said that complete that completion that would be in 2023 because we asked for Budgetary reasons, right? So the fact that we put in a million dollars probably really helped us move the RCAP application to get a million bucks because they see the county, the city has put in nine hundred thousand. They see that we're all contributing, and so they come along. I think it's just as important to, to recognize and to identify to the constituents of Lycoming County that. As we develop partnerships in the economic development side of our responsibilities, um, they will bring back a return. This is just another example, and the Lycoming Mall could be just another example of how we're going to get a, a return on our investment uh, through taxation. And I'm glad Commissioner Marabito brought that up, that uh, we, we want to make sure that these don't go in the hands of nonprofits especially like like a parking garage uh, that it needs to be taxable uh, so that we do achieve that uh, greater return yep so we've seen the um, the music center just constructed um, the um, townhouses down there along retail stores and, and uh, by really by the end of next year yeah, motion. I'll move to approve. I'll take it. Motion, say aye. 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 <coughs> uh, Commissioner, seeking your approval on an amendment to agreement with Extreme Golf Management. Um, this is simply a uh, uh, extension of the the date of the the agreement. Um, this is for the drainage work on the, the golf course. Okay. So we're extending it to complete the work in the spring of 2023. And it's a budget item. Yep. Okay. Motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Aye. 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 And it's nice to be able to say that these will be paid out of the revenues of the golf course. Oh, right? We slope. say that about the <laughs> landfill, but these will be paid out of the revenues of the golf course. And isn't that music? Makes him feel good. He has a new slogan. For next it's year. music to the taxpayers' ears. That like they're it. not paying it out of property tax. 
You hear that, Jason? <laughs> yes, sir. Good news. Yeah, he's got he's got two slogans he can use. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to nine point eleven. Uh, Nancy, what about nine point ten? Nope. Nine point ten. I'm sorry. Hold, hold on. on. Hang on, Nancy. Approval. Nancy. 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 Yeah. Can we hold you up for one second? We have one. I missed minute. one. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Seeking your approval for resolution 2022-24 for emergency temporary contract for specialized cleaning services of uh, the partnership uh, health center. And um, we needed to go out um, to get temporary contract uh, services to clean the, the health center until such time where uh, our custodial force could be brought up to speed, uh, enough folks hired and trained uh, to do the specialized cleaning. Okay. Um, this will actually begin, I believe, this weekend. Yes. Okay. And a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. I'll check it. And we're excited that the health center will be opening up on the uh, wellness center will be opening up Monday. Yep. And uh, we look forward to that grand opening here. Yeah. And everybody has been involved in this process. And I, I would just note that um, Monday will be a soft opening. It'll be open for business. Um, <coughs> the only thing that won't be open just yet is the pharmacy because we just got the certificate of occupancy yesterday. Um, which allows us to proceed now with the pharmacy uh, inspection requirements and licensing. As we invest in this wellness center, uh, as we see the rising cost of insurance over the years, uh, with the help of our broker and, and the wellness center, uh, we've seen our, our um, insurance kind of stay steady the last few years of what we've paid in, and, uh, and this will hopefully start to move back and as our broker said the other day, start to go back in the other direction where we're seeing return on investment by catching things early, by preventing um, things from happening, um, by having the wellness center there. Okay, uh, all fair side? Aye. 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 So carried. All right, Nancy, 9.11. You're up. Uh, juvenile probation is seeking your approval for our Cornell Abraxas contract for 2022 and 2023. Uh, the um, Abraxas drug and alcohol treatment for males was 191.07. It is now 210.18. That's a 10% increase. The Abraxas DNA treatment for female was 232.17, it is now 265.39, a 10% increase. The Abraxas Swan Intensive Open Residential Program was 322.57, and it is now 347.84, <clears throat> that's a 7.835% increase. The uh, South Mountain Specialized Treatment Program was 327.28, it is now 356.54, that's an 8.94% increase. Uh, the shelter we have locked in until 2023. The secure residential treatment, uh, reset, sex offender, and fire setter was 343.09, it is now 360.58, that's a 5.98% increase. <coughs> Detention is locked in until 2023. And for Abraxas Academy in Morgantown, the secure residential treatment, habitual offender, sex offender, it was 348.41, it's now 457.05, and uh, that's a 31.182% increase. And the detention is locked in until 2023. Okay. Motion. So it, I'll move to approve. I'll second. And Comments? Nancy, we don't use all of these all the time, but when we have to use them, that's what we're going to pay. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. <coughs> Nine point thirteen, Jason. 
Yes, sir. Uh, commissioners, this is approve the amendment to the consent order and agreement that we have with the Department of Environmental Protection. This is the one year COA that we carried through with the leachate tank. And as you recall, two years ago, we had a November 30th deadline of 2020, and then we got a one year extension. This year, I'm glad to, to say that we are under construction of putting another liner in this, the tank. We did have to cease the work on Monday due to the temperatures. So we will resume construction of the tank liner next year. Hopefully spring will give us an early construction season. And because of that, I had to ask for another one year extension on the COA. They did say they would be giving it to us. Okay, a motion. That's good news. Yeah. I'll move to approve. A second? I'll second. All in favor, say aye. 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 So carry. Thank you, Commissioners. All right, Commissioner, comment? Mr. Yorks, can you can you stay on the phone a second? Okay. <coughs> we will have a, a special commissioners meeting next Tuesday. I uh, believe the date is the twenty second. I'm mistaken. Yeah, it's tw yes, twenty second. Uh, we will be uh, unveiling our budget at that time. So that's what the agenda will be. I have to do with the budget. And uh, so we'll have a special meeting at 10 a.m. here in this room at that time regarding the 2023 budget. We'll be putting it out for the 30-day public yes. uh, review. Yeah. So the 30 days will start. And then I believe we have a public meeting on the budget the following Wednesday. Right. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? Anything? No, I was going to ask Mr. Yorks about some increases at the landfill that some constituents have brought to my attention as, uh, you know, it's this whole issue with the transfer station. We've been trying to get the large trucks out of the transfer station, the 20 and 40 yards. In the process of doing that, we might have actually disadvantaged some of the mom and pop haulers who don't t come in with a 20 or 30 yard, but come in with a packer truck. Um, and They've raised it with me, and I'd like to talk to him about it, but he's not, he's not there now, uh, because I think that they, they uh, feel as though that side of the mountain, or I should say this side of the mountain has gotten increases. Uh, this would be the second, I think, increase there. Um, and I think they raised some legitimate questions, uh, these haulers, as to whether or not uh, you know, that's really an equitable way to do it. So I, I will call him and, and, and see if we can arrange a, a call with him, maybe. Okay. Commissioner Missouri, you have anything? No, sir. Okay. All the comments. Other than have, have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning, Tom. Commissioner, uh, Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Tom Sheck from Muncie Township. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to read something into the record as a result of, of some research. I provided the commissioners uh, an email over a week ago relative to the proposed sale and redevelopment of Lycoming Mall. I wish to add some items for discussion. I am under no illusion that these have been considered previously, but for the sake of entering them into the public record, I will enumerate them here. The ring road that encircles this property is in deplorable condition. Failing storm drains and crumbling asphalt are only what we can see. It is my understanding that discussions have ensued to investigate a PennDOT grant to rehabilitate this road. To what end? Certainly the township cannot be expected to assume ownership and result in maintenance and upkeep. I am quite certain that the state has no interest in this roadway. In this meeting, last Thursday, comments were proffered regarding a mixed-use environment to include the possibility of senior empty nester housing. As I addressed to you in my previous letter, this entire county, with one exception, is experiencing a critical shortage of emergency services resources. 
Research bears out that senior housing places a higher demand on services, particularly emergency medical. The east end of this county currently relies on one staffed paid EMS transport unit 12 hours a day, seven days a week for coverage. Honestly, it's a crapshoot if more than one EMS call occurs in this area and the paid unit is committed to that first call. How will that be covered? I feel I know the answer. You defer to the municipal government as a second class township code states that it is their responsibility for that service delivery. I assure you that no municipality can bear the cost alone of providing reliable staffing and apparatus to answer the assured demand. Throwing money at the issue does not and will not fix the root problem. I have heard these arguments before, build it and they will come. Well, one has to look no further than my own township and how it is fared on large development projects with respect to tax revenue versus demand on services. Significant refunds of tax dollars have, to be, have had to be provided to the current mall owner after litigation over the assessment, twice. Families United Network also enjoys a not-for-profit status on most of their campus along John Brady Drive. But to be fair, they have in the past provided a small contribution payment in lieu of taxes to the township. I'm aware of yet another project in the township that was hailed as a win-win for the county and municipality in the form of over 55 residences. And they too jumped on the assessment appeal bandwagon. At the end of the day, all these entities demand and expect emergency services. And those who ultimately foot the bill, resident taxpayers and for-profit businesses, who are now being squeezed from every possible angle. I speak for those who eke out an existence on meager pensions or Social Security. They don't see a corresponding increase in their monthly incomes. Yet when the taxes are raised, and they will, they will be the ones footing the bill. I will reference the recent tax abatement, or excuse me, tax refund that Coles just received as a result of today's action, which was through no fault of the commissioners. Jobs? Most jobs created by these proposals will be transitory in nature. Mainly construction is modifications, additions to the existing structures at the mall occur. Sure, there will be some remaining positions, but not nearly enough to bolster local coffers. What guarantees are provided to the taxpayer who gets zero relief? That assessment appeals are fended off in the future. And if what I'm hearing is correct, the county offering a loan to a private entity, to me and to others that I've discussed this, when I've discussed this with many in our, in our township, both private residents and businesses, all taxpayers, we feel it sets a dangerous precedent. I am and have been and continue to be a proponent of responsible development, particularly in the areas of reuse and redevelopment of vacant or existing structures. However, in my opinion, the cart is being placed well ahead of the horse. Just as a developer cannot simply place a building on a parcel of land without an approved plan, it is just as critical to work any proposal with respect to the public infrastructure status, i.e. emergency services, and future needs prior to any final decision. The taxpayers who have been and continue to write the checks should expect and demand nothing less. Thank you. Can, Tom, before you go, can I ask you a couple questions? Sure. The Ring Road is now owned by the mall, correct? That's correct. All right, so that would not change, just so you know. If they're applying for a, uh, a PennDOT multimodal, it's to, it's to try to get some help from the state on fixing the road, and, and they, there's certain needs that you know, certain uh, criteria that have to be met Understood. but it wouldn't be transferred to you all just so you understand okay that. well I let me let me for the record let me clear I am no longer a township supervisor so I'm speaking as a taxpayer oh okay well I'm sorry I, I forgot that but but um, either as a taxpayer or as a or as a township official it won't get transferred to the township in, in fact what we're hoping is that because the private owner owns it if they want to use that road they're gonna have to <coughs> make it you know habitable they're gonna have to fix it up so just so the the township that's that's one thing on the mixed use I mean you raise a really good point on the services and and those are the kinds of issues that I think constituents need to address if it comes for example they're gonna to have to come to zoning 
they're going to have to get all the uh, come to plan to get all the documents in order if they want to build something. And we don't know. We're not telling them what to build. Right. We're simply trying to provide capital <coughs> to take uh, a parcel that is now empty and in danger of deteriorating further, meaning that it becomes a place people hang out, that they sell drugs, that, you know, empty buildings, all the things that go on. Uh, people, you know, getting into trouble. So just so you understand that, that doesn't take away all the responsibility that they have under the zoning and the municipal planning court. And you know that. You know that. I just want the public to understand it. You raise a good point about the nonprofit status. We've talked about that at these meetings before, um, about the fact that, you know, I think we calculated 15% of our, of our parcels are non-taxable. We got a report from Brooke Wright, and I did some math and crunched it. And, and that's a problem that needs to, the state needs to address. Because and they won't. Well, that's where we as, as, as constituents have to push our elected officials, I think, at the state level to, to try to do something, because it is, it's problematic. Um, you know, the other issue related to that is the issue of reassessment and reading your, uh, your letter, your email. Part of the problem we have is, uh, is reassessment in that some, some people are paying and some are not. Um, the jobs, yeah, the construction jobs may be transitory during construction, but we're hoping that whatever comes there will also bring some jobs and bring some housing to try to attract people to the county. And when we attract people, we're repopulating. I know. I, I would agree with that. I also referenced your comments of last Thursday's meeting where you referenced a population statistic from, I think, 2015, I may be off a year or so, where we had, I think, 120-some thousand residents, and now we're down to 112, give or take. Yeah. Okay? Uh, I, I think it's a larger issue. And again, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, and I still am a proponent of redevelopment of that eyesore, I am not against that at all. Yeah. But I am very concerned we're facing a half a mil tax increase as proposed by Muncie Township. Okay, for what? We're going to wind up, the residents and taxpayers, the, for, the for-profit businesses and the homeowners are going to wind up footing this bill when it's all said and done. That's the other takeaway point from all this. And I don't want to get into a back and forth. This is not the venue for that discussion because it doesn't sit with responsibility here. But again, you all play a significant part in looking at this venture and the investor group that has approached you obviously and I'm assuming that there has been discussion between the township and the commissioners over this project at least maybe not the commissioners through the Department of Planning to discuss the ramifications and the possibilities with this project am I am I correct on that I would say no no not this not, point. Not this not point. This but, point. but is it am I correct that this uh, the municipality that you're part of no longer is in county yeah, they're pulling out. They're pulling out I, the county planning. That was a process that we started when I was on the board in right. 2019, and I understand that at the last meeting it did take a vote to be effective January the 1st. But again, I have to defer back to the minutes of that meeting, which I do not have. There were okay. other folks in attendance here today that were in that meeting, I, so I cannot speak to that one way or another. Tom, okay. um, I can tell you that the developers, as soon as um, they get word from the bank, uh, they will be invited to a commissioner's meeting because we have to vote on this, and so I would anticipate uh, sometime in early December that they'll be here at a commissioner's meeting to discuss their plans, and I would invite you to come back and listen to them at that time and hear what they're, uh, obviously they're, they're in contact with uh, um, different entities out there, but they can't do any kind of leases or anything that they want to do because they don't own the property. Right, understood. And the closing is scheduled for December the 8th, is our understanding. They want to close on this by the end of the year, they have to. Um, so this is a fast-moving process. Uh, the bank meets the uh, third Tuesday in November, which I believe is this, this coming Tuesday. Yep. Um, so uh, right before Thanksgiving. They need to get us yeah. documents for yeah. us to vote on. So they're they're gonna, so I would anticipate that uh, we're looking at uh, either the very end of November, or the first week of December, maybe December first. They may be here and to discuss. Uh, we'll, we'll be in contact with the chamber, see what their schedule's like, but uh, we'll invite you back. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for the Thank opportunity you. to speak. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, yeah. we forgot to announce the openings on the Planning Commission. Yes. And, and if anyone is interested in applying to be on the Planning Commission, you can uh, go to the website and there's a place you can pull down an application and submit it. Absolutely. And Ms. Cindy upstairs reminded us and 
we would be remiss if we didn't say that. You want to I would say look at all the yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Good point. Yes, sir. Good morning, commissioners, Mr. Director. I'm going to bring um, Could you state your name for the record, please? I am, yeah. I am Gary Jones uh, from the Spring Farm Trust in 2394 Route 220 Highway, Pensdale, Pennsylvania, and a resident of Muncie Township. Um, I'm here also to talk about the proposal of the loan, mostly, um, from the Act 13 grant money to the proposed purchasers of the Lake Homie Mall. Um, first of all, I wanna, I've seen this, our, our, our label here for so many years, and my wife's family settled in this area in 1796. Um, my wife's great uncle, James Nicholson, was a member of this board for many years back in the 50s. And my neighbor, the late Henry Fry, was a member of this commission for, for many years. And uh, I'm encouraged that there may be a group that would have the vision for a reshaping of the Lycoming like Mall. Actually, over the past few years, I have spoken with several professionals and friends in property management about the ideas of a housing project and an expansion at the Lycoming like Mall. The general opinion has been that it would be too costly and that type of project would be more affordable building on an undeveloped site. Although the negotiated price is probably only slightly more than the 135 acre parcel would cost in a highly visible commercial location, the additional cost of demolition would be a deterring, deterring factor. I could not find out any information about FarmVest LLC, which leads me to believe that this entity has been established specifically for this project. If so, the county should inquire if any part of the $5 million capital infusion by FarmVest comes from private venture capital investors. I assume that the present mall owner, Cohen Retail Investment Group, is pushing for December 8, 2022 closing um, in order to use the unadjusted $11 million loss to offset gains they realized on the sale of other properties during 2022. Unfortunately, the deadline negotiated has put pressure on everyone to make decisions prior to complete and necessary and very common review process. I have your future meetings, which I will be at. Uh, these are some of the things I want you to start thinking about going forward over the next couple weeks. Um, well, first of all, I was very surprised to hear that the county obviously has over $5 million in the Act 13 funds. Logic would be that the funds would have been awarded in the form of grants over the years and only a minimal amount would be available. I fear this investment would degrudge local taxpayers access to their request for needed capital from that Act 13 fund. If the $5 million from FarmFest, $5 million from the bank, and $5 million from Act 13 funds are used to purchase the land in existing buildings, it would be necessary to align with other investors or businesses to fund the refurbishing and construction of the remodeling. Our township and school district have been severely penalized by the successful tax abutments handed down by the abatements handed down by the courts, as Tom was talking about. Unlike the state and county that have a, a larger base to absorb tax paybacks, small budget communities like Muncie Township feels the bite with increased local taxes by homeowners and businesses alike. We cannot absorb, we must adjust tax bills upwards. I realize a completed refurbished like Coney Mall would ultimately realize the Muncie Township and school district more income in the form of property taxes and perhaps additional earned income taxes. We are presently blind to the detail of the project and without assured approvals of any zoning variance necessity and planning commission approvals, we could end up with a vacant property <coughs> and the bank and the county would be landlords of an empty mall. I know the buyers want to be completely open and informative, but, to, but this time is of the essence clause places on a mall December closing date gives no pathway of time and need and 
no process of time to meet the necessary public and professional opinions which are common in everything we do here in Lycoming County. Funding is difficult. With approvals and engineering blueprints is even more difficult. I know this because I have been presently doing a <coughs> minor subdivision and uh, working very close with the, both the county zoning and the county um, planning commission, which they are exceptional. They are kind, they're gentle, they are work with you. I have no complaints whatsoever. <coughs> um, but don't put us in a situation that would force us to cut corners in the future to hurry up approvals because we the taxpayers now have a vested interest in a private enterprise developing development project. This screams conflict of interest. All I ask is that the needless pressure of a mid-December doomsday date be lifted and allow us all time to review and discuss all the what is. One final point. I'm concerned about the way about the, what may lay under the asphalt of a massive parking lot after all these years. I've been 50 years as a public accountant, I'm retired now, but uh, I had a client in Montgomery County many years ago who had a whole farm and was running a service a repair shop out of it. And he had a massive amount of offer for the 16 acres. And before they would proceed, they wanted to do a core sampling for the EPA. He ended up spending half his contracted price on remediation of these soils. So this is what started me thinking about this just last night. If the asphalt and sub-base of the mall left as is, it, there may be no problem. But construction requiring to dig foundations for a housing complex, then the potentials of any type of contaminants and toxins exposed to the future residents comes to the attention of EPA, a massive, costly, and timely remediation may be called for. In closing, I want to say that I am for this project, and I want the partners of FarmFest to be successful, because that would be a win for them and for Muncie Township. What I currently can't support is Lycoming County placing us in the position of banker and code and permit enforcers without opening up the available time slots for questions from the public at large, which is a common practice of the county and municipalities. I ask that the commissioners defer this decision until all necessary due diligence can be completed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Jones, would you give us that, please, yeah. to put in the record? Give. Well, sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I, I you. I apologize for the misspelled words. No, <laughs> listen, you raised some really, really excellent points. And, and the same thing, Tom. You know, the, there was an editorial about transparency. These meetings are for us to have discussion with constituents. And if the meetings have to go to 1 or 2 o'clock, so be it. This is the only time that we really get face-to-face -face with constituents. You have raised an excellent point about, because we fought to protect the money by having in this proposal that we haven't voted on yet, first lien position with the bank and a personal guarantee. But what you're pointing out is that if there is contamination in the soil, we could end up being the owners of a contaminated 138 acres that then requires us to be on the foot for the remediation. Correct. And sometimes, look, elected officials try to do the best thing, okay? But sometimes we can all get ahead of ourselves in terms of wanting to do the good thing and sometimes not seeing some of the details in the forest. I, don't, I can't sit here and tell you, because frankly, we, we have not been on the end of telling them what to do there. We've simply been the bank, you know, participating with the bank in a, in, in a partnership. But you raise some really good points, and I think they're points that need addressing. And I certainly am going to look over. That's why I want you to leave this document with us, because quite honestly, I don't know whether they as purchasers have done the due diligence that a purchaser would do when I before I buy a building or a property if I'm required to have the inspection I do the due diligence because once I own it I know I'm on the hook for it thank you very much for coming today and thank you for uh, for really helping us to see both of you okay it's and and really I truly mean this we, these meetings are for this kind of discussion I encourage people to come um, and and we're gonna need to get answers to that I assume that the bank you know, the bank has been doing the underwriting, and we've been relying on the bank to do the underwriting. Uh, I don't want to say I assume, because that is a terrible <coughs> word to use, 
But I would like to check with the bank as to whether or not there's been due diligence done and in the contract of sale so that we don't get stuck with the bank, even if it's a small amount of money that's ultimately, uh, you know, we acquired for. Sir, so I want to thank both you and Tom for being here. Now, I'd like to add to that to the fact that, you know, we read an editorial uh, about having uh, public meetings and, and addressing a number of public issues and where they said we were doing it behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, I don't believe that's the case. But we just had that meeting, we just read that article a few weeks ago, and, and any big, any huge uh, decisions that the commissioners had to make, uh, that editorial brought it to light. And that's why we said, let's, let's, let's get this out to the public so that the public and, and township supervisors and whoever can comment. This is a huge, huge um, uh, finding right here. Because uh, as you said, you know, this could lead to a lot of liability which I believe that they, there's going to be phase ones and phase twos at any any development, but that was never brought up in the conversation, and I can't thank you enough for bringing it up here today. You're welcome. Thank you. So I want to thank you both for being here. Uh, regarding the developers, um, these gentlemen are the ones that there's, there's one out of Muncie. They were touring State College, so they're local. Um, they're the ones that developed Chipotle's. In Loyal Sock, they're the ones that developed the Texas Roadhouse in Loyal Sock. Uh, they've done a lot of projects in, in State College area. Uh, they have tons of contacts throughout the country. They're very good at what they do. The bank has done business with them. The bank that's talking about financing again has done business with them prior. Um, I've talked to other people in Loyal Sock, Township Supervisors. They follow through what they said they're going to do. Uh, this isn't some place where they're looking at the tax write-off. It's just going to sit there and be empty. These guys are developers. They're in the business of developing, uh, and they want to make this this uh, prosperous. And uh, so, they'll be here to talk about their, their vision and goals. And I think you do bring up some good points that need to be answered. But I think them being uh, developers, I'm sure they've, they've done all their homework. I, I I agree. You know, because having researched these things with other people before, and it's. I believe they have great intentions, and I know they know what they're doing. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Um, but again, whatever is hidden in the process, this is a big project. It is huge. It's no, huge. You, what you raise is that we have not been told that they have done a statistical sampling of core samples throughout the 138 acres that gives them assurance that there is not liability underneath. We have not been told that. It has not come up in the conversation. We were more focused on protecting the taxpayers' money and making sure that we got the money back. Uh, and so, you know, it's a good point. And, and maybe, but we need that commit. We need to know that so we're not lending on a potentially contaminated property. That's what you're telling us. And that's very good for you to tell us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Presumably that would have been done when they built them all. Not necessarily. Well, the, 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 the regulations have changed, and you had Sears Auto Center right. that yeah. operated there for many years. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. And, and that floor's got issues. And yeah. that was the reason that my client in Montgomery County had a problem because he ran a service right. repair garage, and they weren't looking because the, what they found it was the farmer that had had the place before used oil on the driveway to keep dust down over right. the years. Right. And that's where the contamination came up. It yeah. wasn't from this garage, but then again, I was going to say, like Tom said, the Sears has that. And I know that parking lot has not been sealed for many, many years. And even going back when there was a lot of activity, the cars would sit there, and my car, even if it's a new one, it drips oil, it drips gas, it drips things out of the car. And that yeah. eventually seeps in underneath that asphalt. Yeah. Thank no, you. thank you. Thank I mean, can you hear a public comment this time? Any online? I have one online. Yeah. Uh, MCG. Uh, the suggestion that voters who are not able to physically access a voting location should be compelled to use mail mail-in ballots when that method is being questioned should probably be re-examined. Okay, thank you. Tom? Or 
Warren, Tom Adams, Williams Court, and Curl, something different. <coughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, you see our, you know, difficulties with things going on in our in our world. Uh, Psalm 119, 136 says, "My eyes shed streams of water because they keep not my law." Um, and that's God speaking to us. God's a God all about law and order from the beginning all the way to and through, through eternity. And uh, Christ didn't come just to save us from our sins, but to bring law and order in our individual life, in our family life, in our civil life, and, uh, and in all aspects of life around us. And when we step out and let um, chaos be a be the rule, we're not following God's commands for us to live a safe life. And you can see the laws of science and the laws of nature are ordered by God too. And we have, um, this is one reason why we're having destruction in our, in our um, uh, economic system, is because we have people that think the earth is uh, on its own and um, we can affect its destruction. Uh, through through the natural resources that has been provided to us by God, um, and that uh, climate change is something that we have to be concerned with as far as our our uh, involvement with the with the earth. Uh, we can affect the, um, local areas in certain like building areas. We have some pollution under the ground or whatever. Those can be remediated. We don't affect the, the entire world's climate by our activity. It's impossible. We have uh, well-known scientists, PhDs, that will swear to this. Um, S. Fred Singer, he was a, uh, he developed the um, weather system, that weather satellite system for the United States. Um, and he has uh, another book out, Hot Talk, Cold Science, that will educate you on uh, the nonsense with the climate change. And that's what this whole thing is driving from COVID all the way through is the destruction of, of the West and for people to live free and to be safe. Because once we do away with fossil fuels, you're going to see a lot more death and destruction. And not just with these COVID shots, too. Don't take those shots because it's the same, the same uh, uh, goal is to depopulate the Earth. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Anyone else at this time? Okay, we've completed our agenda, so our next. Commissioner's meeting will be Tuesday, the special Tuesday, November 22nd meeting here at 10 a.m. to uh, open up our budget. And no meeting Thursday. And no meeting Thursday. Why not? It'll be Thanksgiving and we wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving and uh, take your families. Oh, wait. Yes. Yes. Are, are we having. Uh, uh, Board yes, yeah. the retirement board meeting is yeah. starting immediately. We have in the audience our esteemed <laughs> colleagues. Joiner has been uh, informed. Yeah, we're not going to get over They have You guys want me to go over to uh, yeah. go over to the. Uh, uh, one, one second. One second. Yeah, you can do that, Commissioner. Okay, I'll go over the award. All right. Do we need him for a quorum? We might need him. Hold on. Oh, yeah. The attorney is us. saying to stay. Yeah, we're going to have a vote. I mean, the consultant is saying to say, stay. No, no, I'm not saying no, no. Oh. I'm there's saying you want me to stand up there. You want me to meet up there. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll go back. We'll go back. The public meeting is next. Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Tuesday. There's nothing Thursday. There's nothing Thursday, so it's going to be Tuesday. Okay. Originally, you didn't have anything for tonight, did you? No. 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 I must have read it. <laughs> yeah. No problem. But next Thanks. Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Next Tuesday. Tuesday. Yep. Thank